everyone and welcome back. Today I wanted to share with you a project that has been a very long time in the actual making and in the planning for me. You see, I'm finally getting around to showing you the pair of breeches that I made back in July. Now, the actual plans for that project go back years. I have always thought about actually getting around to making myself an 18th century men's suit, but I just never have. I've made dozens for other people, just never for myself. So we're going to be taking a look at that project today. Breeches are just such a wonderful and complex garment, and I know they can be a little bit scary, but they are such an essential part of menswear in the 18th century. They really were the typical lower garment for men's Western wear during this time. And though trousers were around, they were more often worn by people doing labor. So if you were farming or working on a ship, that was really the appropriate time for that garment up until the very end of the 18th century. Prior to that, breeches were a more typical item in the suit of men's clothes, along with the waistcoat and the coat. The difference between breeches and trousers mostly comes in at the knee bands. So unlike trousers, which go all the way down to the ankle, and in terms of the more laboring sort, were more often loose in the leg, though there were gaiter trousers that were much tighter and actually did have to button down from the calf to the ankle, but breeches and just below the knee in a knee band and very often use a buckle to sort of cinch in that knee band to help hold up the stockings. So they really did serve a function as well as a form at that time. And honestly, breeches came in so many varieties. There are so many options within just one simple pair. You not only get to choose all of your proportions, but how you deal with the plackets and how you deal with the knee bands, how you how many buttons you really want to use, how many pockets you want to have and where you want to have them. There are so many variations on that alone, whether you want them in the front, facing towards the back, set in your waistband for a watch pocket, hidden in your waistband for who knows what. I can only assume snacks. But there's just all sorts of variations on how you want to not only fit and pattern the garment, but construct them as well. Every single pair of breeches is slightly different depending on the body shape, the fabric choices and all of those elements that you're putting into them, they really are a constant garment of learning. I was fortunate enough to start my process of learning about them through one of the Burnley and Trowbridge workshops. That was actually taught by Mark Hutter, who is now the master tailor at Colonial Williamsburg, and it was a wonderful introduction to that topic area. And if you're ever able to take any of their workshops, I highly recommend it. But breeches really are something that is best learned about by doing it over and over again. There are just so many different things that you learn from every single pair. And that's what I really wanna share with you today. Not only did I learn things specific to that exact pair of breeches that I just made for myself, but there are things that I have found that are more consistent across all the different types and styles and fits of breeches as well. For patterning my breeches, I decided to start with one of the shapes that's in costume close-up. It's a fairly neutral shape of breeches and I like the proportions of it, there's nothing really weird going on, and it's a good late 18th century shape. Now I know perfectly well that the likelihood that these will fit me right off the page is very slim, so I assume that there are going to have to be some adjustments. But I'm going to go ahead and transfer out the pattern as is first, leaving some space on the paper for that. Looking at the measurements across the body, it is a few inches too small for me, so I'm going to go ahead and proportionally add about an inch to both the front and the back, and that should overall add four inches to the measurement. You have to keep in mind when you're measuring the top of the breeches pattern that you're not really measuring the waist. Unlike most women's garments, which really do fit at the waist, Men's breeches during this time fit fairly low. In fact, the waistband is really more around the hip bone area. So this measurement needs to be bigger than your high waist and needs to be closer to a very low waist or a high hip. I went ahead and added some proportional measurements to both the front and the back, and I adjusted some of the angles of the back just slightly. We're going to go ahead and cut everything out of muslin, stitch that together to make a mock-up, and see where the problem areas might be. Now, I generally don't take the time to actually put seam allowances in on my mock-ups. I just kind of draw out these stitch lines and then hack around from there. For the first mock-up, I found that there was some excess fabric at the very front of the breeches, so I went ahead and pinned up that section right there, and I'll make that adjustment on the pattern later. 
I also found that the back was a little bit on the full side and that, surprisingly enough, the waistband was too big and it also ended up being a little too tall. I didn't want to reduce the size of the back of the breeches too much because you still need to be able to bend your leg and sit down, hence why that bubble butt is there on most types of breeches. So I'll make some minor adjustments to the pattern before I go ahead and cut out the breeches, but there's nothing too dramatic and I don't want to take things in too much since the muslin will stretch far more than the silk fabric that I'm going to be using. When cutting out the breeches, like almost all of the garments that I make, I don't actually put seam allowance on the patterns, I just simply draw out the actual stitch lines, and that's especially helpful when you are actually going to be hand stitching and pressing back all of those seam allowances. You don't really need to worry about where that edge is since you're not running it through a machine, you just need to know where your actual stitch or finish line is. In addition to cutting out the main fabric, we also need to cut out facings and pockets. I'm just doing this out of a natural linen because that is a very close color to my fabric. Bleached linen is also very typical and acceptable. For the pockets, I am not making a separate pattern. I'm just using my front shape to draw out on the pattern what the top and side lines need to be, and I'll figure out what length I actually want, and the width of the pocket will be based on the proportions of the fall front and the pocket. Like many of my tailored pieces, my favorite sort of structural interfacing to use is what we call beetled linen. You can also see this as glazed linen, and it is very similar to certain types of Taylor's collar canvas as well. It just happens to be that this particular type is a little bit thinner and crisper than collar canvases. Now for the construction of the breeches, it is incredibly essential that you spend a lot of time basting all of your pieces together. There are so many tiny parts and pieces to this that pinning them into place and trying to stitch around everything is just nearly impossible. I also really like to use a board for most of my work. You can work at a flat table, but I find that the height of the table in comparison to where I'm sitting isn't always ideal. So instead, what I have is an art board, and it's a very lightweight balsam wood board, and it goes wherever I need to sit in the house, and it provides a nice flat surface at just the right height for me to pin things together and baste them and lay them out, and it just makes working on tailored pieces like this so much easier. I know that hand stitching can seem like an incredibly daunting thing if you haven't done it a lot before, but basically you have to remember that it really comes down to three major types of stitches. You're going to have the big long running stitches of your basting stitches. You're going to have back stitches or spaced back stitches, depending on what level of security you need or what sort of visual you want on the exterior, but they're basically the same thing, just really tightly spaced or not. And then your whip stitch movement, which might be used to fell over a seam allowance, or it might be used to finish off the folded edges, placing the lining up against the exterior fabric, or it might just simply be used as a whip stitch to finish off your seam allowances. Once you've learned those three main stitches, there's only slight variations on each one of them that give you just about everything you're going to need to know when it comes to hand sewing. One of the key things with breeches is as you're doing these stitches, you wanna make sure that you're putting in a lot of reinforcement stitching. There's going to be a great deal of stress on these garments that you wouldn't necessarily expect to see on most women's garments of this era, simply because the skirts of gowns aren't seeing a lot of stress and the bodices have the stays underneath to help spread out that stress. Whereas with breeches, especially with pockets and flaps, there are so many integral parts that are going to see a lot of stress and wear and tear. So there's a lot of reinforcement stitching done in different places, such as around the bottom of the little opening between the full front and the pockets, just to make sure that that doesn't eventually wear, tear, and rip out. You can even put extra pieces of interfacing behind those areas and stitch through those as well for added security. 
Now when it came to the pockets on this garment, I knew that I had options with variations, as I mentioned earlier. I chose to simply put the standard two front pockets in, and then to put a little welted pocket into the waistband for a pocket watch. Now I did make a mistake here in the fact that I did not put this welted pocket in before I put the lining on the back of my waistband. So I would definitely recommend doing it that way first. It only thankfully made it a little bit more difficult. Now again, there are so many ways that you can do a welted pocket. I chose with this one to have the type of welt that is a little bit taller than the opening, meaning that I won't have to worry about seeing any of the pocketing behind it because that's going to have plenty of coverage. The actual welted part, I also go ahead and make sure that I put in that little strip of beetle linen for reinforcement. It keeps it nice, clean, and crisp and it also helps support the weight of anything that goes into that pocket. You want to make sure that you don't gradually end up with a curving, slumping pocket front. There's plenty of reinforcement that needs to go into pockets for this reason, and it's less so a concern with, say, a watch pocket, and more so a concern when we're getting to the point of putting pockets into our coats or our waistcoats, but it's something to keep in mind for this point already. If you have a pocket that's going to see a lot of use and a lot of wear and tear, not only do you want to make sure that you reinforce with really good stitching, but you want to reinforce with interfacing as well, whether it is interfacing in the welt itself or by layering interfacing behind the pocket mouth and actually cutting into that and stitching through that as well as your outer layers. It makes so much more sense to put in that extra reinforcement and those extra layers of stitching at this point in time before the garment starts to deform and pull and stretch in all of the ways that just make it look far less clean and tailored. As I was doing some research into breeches, I started to wonder where the term breeches actually came from. I've heard them also termed breeches, which seems to be just a variation on the same word, and it both seem to be regularly used depending on region and time period. What I could find about the etymology of breeches basically takes it back to the same base word as to break something. So the idea that there is is that since it is a bifurcated garment, meaning that it is split in two, you have two separate legs, sort of like a branch, which is, again, the same sort of area, the very early basis for the word breeches comes from that same base that gradually changed through time and eventually became commonly used as breeches. Whereas prior to that, we tended to use the term hose, which eventually became a way to refer to the separate legged garment that didn't actually have the seam done up along the crotch, and that's why you needed a codpiece or other sort of coverage, whereas breeches were a complete garment. However, the fact that we think of it as two separate legs brought together is why we tend to think of it as a pair of breeches and not just a singular breech. The same thing carries over today into a pair of pants or a pair of trousers, because it is two legs that are stitched together. When it comes to seaming up your garment, there are a combination of different seams that they use. The back stitch is an incredibly strong seam, but it still goes under a lot of stress on things like breeches. So if you're going to be doing a seam that gets stitched and opened up flat, it might do to do some extra reinforcement. That's the case with the back of this pair of breeches. I'm stitching a little strip of linen that covers all of that seam allowance on. Not only is this a way to finish off that seam allowance, but it makes sure that the stress of anything on that back seam is placed across three lines of stitching rather than just the one. Visible stitching on the exterior of your clothing is very typical for times where you're doing hand sewing. 
it's not really until we get into the early to mid 20th century that that idea of hiding all of your stitching really starts to come into play. So that's why patterns that you see from the 1940s onwards tend to do a lot of stitch right side to right side, turn it right side out and bag line it so that way you don't see your stitching at all. That's not the case at this time period. So you're going to have to get used to seeing a lot more of your stitches, especially when it comes to reinforcement. One of the stronger seams that you want to put in as well is the inseam. Now you can do different forms of reinforcement for this. I really like the method where you actually fold back your seam allowance just a little shallow and then you stitch through the four layers rather than just the two. My first official fitting for the pair of breeches showed me that though it fit fairly well in the body, the waistband was far too tall in proportion to my body. So I knew that I was going to have to adjust that, but I wanted to make sure that I could still move, could still sit, and while there was some extra in the legs of these breeches, I knew that this fabric does not stretch. It doesn't have give like a wool or a jersey knit pair of breeches could. And so yes, I wanted to make sure that I could actually sit down in these breeches because that extra really has to be there for a reason. And I also wanted to make sure since I tend to do tailoring work that I could still bend my knees if I unbuckle my knee bands and unbutton my plackets at the knees. The next fitting, I went ahead and adjusted that waistband down a little bit and I fit the knee band. I simply used a ribbon that didn't have any stretch to it that's about the right width. The knee band you need to make sure gives you enough space that you can still bend your knee and sit down while you're wearing them closed. And you might find that you need to end up sort of gathering in the actual leg of your breeches a little bit more to fit into the knee band because the knee band needs to be snug enough to hold up your stockings, but the knee part of the breeches needs to be large enough that you can still bend your knee and there is room for your actual kneecap. You also wanna make sure that you leave a slight angle to the knee band as it doesn't need to be as long in the back as it does in the front to again, get over your actual knee. In addition to the knee bands, there's a little section that goes underneath the buckle down at the bottom of each little facing. You can actually cut this onto your breeches, but it is a bit of a awkward pattern shape when you do that and can be a little bit of a waste of fabric. So I generally will choose to actually stitch on a separate little scrap of fabric to accommodate this. You can't actually see the seam because it goes underneath the knee band and the buckle. So there's not really a concern about that and it is a way to effectively save a little bit of fabric. <laughs> 